Welcome to another episode of Corporate CPR, where we breathe life back into your organization, projects, and processes, giving you insights to recovery and avoiding corporate mortality events. Today, we will be talking about why you may not be hearing your employees, and joining us to contribute to the conversation is Marsha Acker. Welcome, Marsha. Hi, Jenna. Nice to meet you. I'm so glad you could be here today. Same. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Can you share a little bit about your background? <clears throat> Well, uh, the, the 50,000 foot like reader's digest version that I would say is uh, my, I often say my first, um, the first part of my career uh, was in software engineering. So I had two degrees in software engineering and spent some time really passionate about bridging the voice of end users and developers. And so that was my first foray into the skills of facilitation and group process and helping to connect people in in collaboration that became a really big passion i'd say the second part of my career i don't i, I work a lot with tech leaders so i have a fondness for the tech space but actually in my own journey i found um i reached a point where i started working with quite a bit of change and large-scale change i love the idea uh, you know that we can improve things through technology or through change initiatives. But I found in my own leadership, um, there were many times where the challenge in change really seemed to be in the interpersonal dynamics more so than it was kind of in the process of the change. And so that's actually the piece that led me down the path of becoming uh, an executive coach. And so I work today with leaders and teams. I say I'm a leadership and team coach. And I'm really about helping people work with one another. So working with other humans. But that's that's sort of the the two de- <laughs> the, the journey and sort of the two ends of that spectrum. Excellent. And so um, yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about how you know uh, employee communication, employee feedback may not be being accurately heard and. Um, one of the things you you talk about is um, don't end up with a front page crisis. So what does that really mean? <laughs> yeah. Well, so, you know, there was a, um, I think a front page crisis, I would sum it up to say it's that moment in time. And I, um, if you're leading a small or large organization, and if you've ever been in a situation where this has happened, I think it's um, it's certainly high stakes. But it's, it's the moment where you're getting feedback from your employees on the front page of the newspaper. And um, I often think, you know, there's so much that gets a corporation or an organization on the front page where they're a front page news story. So there are lots of examples. There, um, there are big examples that have happened in the workplace we work was one of them. Uber has been one of them. There's been a number of other organizations that you find um, there's something that's happened. There's a crisis that's happened in the organization and it's manifesting on the front page as a, as a front page news story. So that's in general, you know, I, that's, that's what I call a front page crisis. Like, like the stakes are high. You just got some feedback. Well, and so employee, our, our leaders, you know, aren't like, I guess, intently turning a deaf ear or anything. So what, what's really kind of preventing them from really hearing? And when we say hear, it's like actually comprehending what um, they're, the feedback they're receiving from employees. Yeah, I think there are lots of, um, I think there are lots of reasons why something like that happens. But your question, like, I love your question. Like, what is it about? Because if you were to ask any of those leaders, they would likely tell you, you know, if I said, you know, do you listen to your employees? Of course. Mm -hmm. Um, And they would give you all kinds of examples. We have employee feedback surveys. We have um, employee groups that meet. You know, we have up and down communication. We do 360. So I think there are lots of structures. Um, I like if I if I were to give you an example of one organization that um, found themselves actually there's it's sort of if I were to compare and contrast two different organizations actually because both of them were kind of mid size organizations they were two to three thousand people each mm-hmm. um, and they mm, more international so they had offices across you know different cultures but. Um, they each had a front page crisis about the same time. 
And what was really fascinating to me was the way in which their leadership teams engaged in the front page crisis was a, was a complete contrast. So in company A, we'll call them, uh, their leaders, you know, really battened down the hatches. They called the HR, they called the legal, they got all the ducks in a row, they became really closed off. Um, and what was happening was employees were really upset about policy and how employees were being treated. And that's, uh, that's actually sort of the thematic topic of both of those um, stories. But in company A, leaders really um, kind of got entrenched and defended their position or their point of view. So um, they didn't respond to news press, uh, press releases. Um, employees inside the company were trying to engage in conversation. That all got shut down, legal got involved. So it became a very um, kind of defensive stance on we're right, they're wrong. And when you talked to the leaders in that organization, they were mortified. Um, it felt like a complete, uh, they felt completely blindsided by what was happening. It was a surprise in some ways to them. They'd never sensed that that was actually really going to happen, you know, to that degree. And, and so that's that's one example of leaders intending really good. Uh, they would have told you they had all the things in place, but their you know their response was to pull in um, corporate and legal and change policy and procedure. So the second company, so we'll, we'll call them Company B. Um, had a completely different approach. So they, um, the leadership team in that company got really, they cleared their calendars. They started to go and meet um, kind of in the, the process of having dialogue with people across the organization. And they engaged in small, you know, smaller kind of dialogue group conversations. And they just started to listen. So they didn't respond. They didn't respond to outside press, but they also didn't prepare any kind of statement internally. They just started this multi-week long process of what they called listening sessions. Um, and they really sat down and um, without needing to respond, provide answers, they weren't about trying to find solutions. So um, they too were blindsided, you know, <laughs> um, surprised by what had happened, mortified. I mean, it's completely embarrassing to be um, you know, essentially called out from it. So the two different organizations, two different sets of leaders, two very different responses to what was happening. Mm -hmm. And I'd say in the run-up to both of those, what, what had fallen away inside the organization, while there were structures that each organization would have said they're listening to their employees, there's... Mm, there were mechanisms to receive information. But I think the act of actually asking people, what's it like here? What's it like to work here? What's your experience like? Um, in the language of structural dynamics, which is a theory of face-to-face -face communication, it gives us a way of talking about, um, of, of coding kind of how we have conversations. And there are three communication domains that we speak in power, the language of um, action, meaning, the language of data, vision, purpose, and affect, the language of care and connection for others. And what was happening in that organization is that they had some, in, in many ways, kind of managed the language of affect out of the, the, the corporate dialogue in, in both of those organizations. And so that act of sort of sitting down and saying, my calendar's clear. I'm here. I want to actually listen to what you have to say. Tell me what it's like to work here. Tell me how it feels. Tell me what your experience is. It's, that is a way of prompting for the language of affect. And I think what had been happening in that organization was the language of affect just wasn't part of it. So like you you asked this overarching question at the beginning, like what how are leaders not hearing their employees? I think a lot of times we are um, unaware of how we're engaging in conversations and we're so focused on pace, deadlines, 
Um, we need to get things done. And it's not that that's bad, but I just think that we as leaders sometimes don't also carve out space to actually listen and to ask. So surveys don't always, surveys are helpful, but they don't tell you the whole story. Um, 360 feedbacks are helpful, but they still don't tell you the whole story. So I think sometimes we're missing, like really listening and really asking, you know, what it's like. One of, I think your, your, um, I guess approach is that is kind of breaking down that communication. Like you were just, you kind of gave an example of, um, you know, so that we can understand how we're communicating, maybe how the other person's communicating and, and what the gap is. Um, do you want to, to talk a little bit about what that overarching structure looks like? Yeah, it's a, um, it's called structural dynamics. It comes from research done by David Cantor um, at Harvard. It started back in, his research actually began back in the, um, the 70s. And in late 80s, early 90s, he ported it into um, corporate uh, business relationships as well. So it actually started in, in looking at family systems. But what I think is really fascinating and so incredibly useful about structural dynamics, it is, it's a theory of face-to-face -face communication. And, and so you might be thinking, great, there's a, a 5,000 <laughs> theories of communication. I think what's different about structural dynamics is that it's of all the models that I've looked at around communication and it's people also sort of lump personality assessments and things like that into it. But what structural dynamics does is it gives us a, it gives us a technology for being able to make sense of this moment. Like Jana, even with you and I, as we, you know, engage in this conversation, we're exchanging sentences, words, and you know, we might be doing fine if we kept going and working together for a while, we're going to reach a point where at one point you're going to say something and I'm going to go, what? Or I'm going to say something and you, and you are, might think, and the, whether you'd say it out loud or not would be the second part of it, but I don't really get that, Marsha, or like, where did that come from? So I think we all meet those moments. What structural dynamics does is it gives us a morally neutral language for being able to code the conversation in the moment so that we can make sense of when there is um, clash or breakdown in the conversation or when we're just getting stuck and not moving forward. So essentially there are um, kind of four levels of being able to look at communication. There's the action modes, which are kind of the way we set direction in the conversation. There are communication domains that um, help us identify what we care about. So that's that power, affect, and meaning. Um, and what can often happen in the communication domains are really the ones that actually raise the stakes for us the most. So if I'm speaking in affect, which is um, if I were to say, you know, I really care about, I'm, I'm reading this book on leadership because I really care about the people that I work with and I wanna become a better leader. And if I'm talking to someone who speaks in power and you ask them the same question, they might respond in power. They might say, well, I'm reading a book on leadership because I wanna get ahead. And the very fact that we're talking about the same topic, we're answering or responding to the same question, but for someone high in affect, to hear someone in, in power say, I you know, wanna get ahead and someone in affect cares about people, at that moment, we're essentially gonna be talking past one another. It's like the, the words that we've said don't land for the other person. And I think that happens all the time. And mm. we, it's, I think it seems innocuous a lot of times when it does happen, but what I have watched over and over again, I, I've coached a CEO and a COO who um, one spoke in high power and the other spoke in high meaning. And despite their best efforts, that was part of their dilemma and being able to work together is just couldn't bridge to the other language to meet the other person in that language. And so it resulted in a lot of conflict and a lot of assumptions and things like that. So actions, um, communication domains, 
The third level is operating systems, the way we, um, the way we orient to one another. And there are three of those. And then the fourth level is childhood story. So the things that laid the foundation for us, um, early experiences that we had that then influence how we behave in the room. And so what structural dynamics gives us is a language, kind of a taxonomy or a technology, if you like, for being able to make sense of in the moment, here's what just happened. And ah, like now I know, like actually that was me speaking in affect and someone else speaking in power. And I know how to speak in power too. So let me just bridge to that language and that'll help us get through. So it's, it's about being able to see what's happening and then change the nature of the discourse in the moment. Um, you mentioned, yeah, being able to change, but you know, how, how fluid are people in, in that, I guess, you know, especially you, you, you talked about, you didn't talk about meaning as much, but kind of that, you, you know, intent and, and uh, uh, like, yeah, on purpose and, yeah. and, and that, and to me that kind of, I think of like an entrepreneur or a, vi you know, a visionary and not everybody can speak in those language. I know it doesn't necessarily yeah. have to be in that extreme, but so how fluent are people at being able to um, move between the different communication styles? Actually, we all are pretty fluent um, to varying degrees. So, you know, in, in my repertoire, my communicative competence, um, power and affect are the highest. Meaning is the one that I have to work out the most. Um, I can bring it. I, I just, it takes me a moment or it just takes me a little bit more intentionality. And that'll be true for all of us. Um, I think that uh, the fluency of it, though, is part of the leadership development work to do. So um, a lot of times when I'm working with a leadership team, the very first thing, a, an individual leader or a leadership team, the very first thing I'm doing is just helping them um, just get familiar with the taxonomy and the structure of conversation, because then that's sort of the, it's kind of the groundwork or the rails that we can come back to over and over again, because um, it does become a um, it's kind of a dual process. Like when I'm in conversations, can I be paying attention to both what we're talking about and then also how we are communicating with one another? So mm. it does take a little bit of dual processing in the moment, but I think that's, that is part of the leadership work. And then there are reasons why, you know, there's, there'll be reasons why for me to explore, like why meaning is lower and why um, power uh, I'm really good at. And like any model, something that you do really well, you can tend to overdo. Mm. And so I think that's, you know, so many leaders, uh, I think that I work with today, particularly in this midsize, you know, entrepreneurial type of environment where I, I just think about pace is the phrase that comes to mind for me the most. It is pace is what's expected. It's how everybody is performing. And I think it's about just having range in your leadership. So there are times where we need to be in power, getting things done, taking action. And then there are also times where we need to step back and create space um, to ask questions of like, oh, you know, what's the impact of this going to be on others? Or why are we going after this? What's the purpose of it? Um, so we can tend to overdo one of these and that's where we get into trouble. Hmm. You mentioned that, um, that, you know, part of the work is to explore um, why it is you're even doing that. And um, mm -hmm. can you talk a, bit, a little bit about why we, I guess, gravitate towards one over the other, maybe naturally? Yeah, well, a lot of um, it actually proved out in the research uh, that there are so many um patterns that show up for us in our behavior in the room as adults that are highly informed by um, events that happened to us as we were growing up. So David Cantor talks about it from the age of about one to the age of 23. So that's a, that's a, pretty, that's a pretty large swath of one's life um, to have experiences, sort of early childhood experiences. And um, I write, actually I write about it in the book, um, but one of my childhood stories was growing up and having friends on the playground in elementary school. And there were three of us. And one of those friends of mine, really good, 
But every day um, she played a game called the leave out game. And every day it was either myself or my other friend that was going to get chosen to be played with. And the other was going to be left out. Mm. And like that story, as I, um, I remembered it, but I really had never unpacked it, nor sat down to think about how that story actually shows up as an adult in the room, in my role, leading or managing. And so what um, the, the, I could tell the moral story, you know, I could make her wrong and I could make me the victim of it. But if we, if I look back at actually that story also had a structure to it. So I, what I would say about the structure is that my friend was moving in closed power. So she was making a move um, and I wasn't really asked. It was closed system because I wasn't really asked if I wanted to be chosen or not chosen. So it created this story for me of um, when I encounter someone speaking um, in, the, in the structure of move and close power, what was happening for me as an adult is I was sent right back to the playground and um, almost creates high stakes. And so when I'm, you know, our behavior changes when we're in low stakes and it changes when we're in high stakes. It's not great when we're in high stakes. We don't tend to behave at our best. Um, and so what was happening for me is I would encounter colleagues who, who would make moves in closed power. And I couldn't figure out why some days I would shut down or I would disengage or I would completely kind of remove myself from the situation until I sort of connected the childhood story and the structure of it to what happened as an adult. Um, part of my job then as in my own leadership development became to realize actually closed system has a real value. Um, I had sort of made that out. I hadn't really understood why, but I'd really made it out to be not helpful or useful. Um, that had me behaving in very open system. I'll, I'll go around, ask for everybody's input, ask for everybody's opinion, but I can get stuck there, not sort of closing it off and, and bringing it to a closed decision. So I had work to do and it's really been, it's so helpful. So even, even now I can, as soon as someone makes a move in close power, it can flip, you know, flip a switch for me. And I really way better now about catching it and going, oh, that's, oh, that's that pattern. And so I, now I know how to show up in that conversation. So okay. it's just a. Yeah. So you, I was going to say, you, you mentioned the operating system and there's three of them and we have, I guess we haven't really defined those yet. So do you want to share, you, I mean, you briefly mentioned open and close, but there's a third yeah. and maybe describe a little bit of what those three mean. Yes. Yeah, so um, operating systems kind of get laid down early for us, and they are, they're like the norms, they're the, maybe the implicit norms about how we're going to operate or interact with someone else, and there are three of them. So the first one is open system, meaning I want to, I want to hear from all voices, let's go around the room. Um, closed system is more high, there's more hierarchy in closed system, it's defined, um, it's coming, you know, we're, we're typically looking for in closed system, there's one person uh, that's sort of making decisions. So we're not asking people, we're just we're letting them know. And then there's random system, which is um, the place of innovation and creativity. So random system orients a lot more to autonomy. Um, if you there's a lot of organizations often talking about let's empower people, there that's that's a statement where people are often wanting um, folks to operate more in random system. Now, whether it actually plays out that way or not would be, we'd have to actually look at what's happening in the moment. But open, closed, and random are the three operating systems. Um, and so I, can you highlight, you mentioned like you know, one of your challenges um, is that maybe you never reach a decision point. Mm -hmm. and, um, but on the other hand, that collaboration also can be really good for making people feel valued and getting ideas. Yes. What about the other two? What are kind of the pros and cons of them? So random, um, there's a, I'm working with a leadership team right now who op actually operates in high random systems. So there's a high degree of autonomy. Um, uh, people don't need to check in with other people about decisions that they're making. So they've, they're clear about their roles. Um, they're clear about kind of the overall vision of where they're headed, but there's a great deal of autonomy. So 
one of the things that happens is there's a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations or different um, verticals or departments will go off and kind of make their own decisions. They operate, so they operate kind of autonomously. It is, um, it's the place of a lot of innovation. So I think if you, many startups, not to stereotype, but I think you'll see many startups often operate in a high degree of autonomy where multiple people are wearing, you know, multiple hats and they're, they don't do a lot of looking around or permission gathering from anybody. They just, you know, something happens and somebody just takes action and that would be random power. They just take action and go get the thing done that needs to get done. So I think in many ways, uh, you know, startups often operate in that. The leadership team that I'm working with right now is um, high random power and they are realizing one of the challenges of that operating system overdone is they're lacking the alignment that they need, um, sort of that shared understanding. So they've started to lean kind of heavily into open system and having more um, full group conversation, spending enough time kind of in open meaning so that they're getting clear about purpose and, and really asking the question, why do we exist? Like, has anybody ever really asked that question? Um, and so they're kind of grappling with some of those things. And they're kind of at the edge right now where closed system is the least used in their, in their mm -hmm. repertoire. And um, they are now starting to name, actually, we're spinning. Um, and we're getting a little bit stuck. And we are starting to see that we need more closed system. But it's not, uh, it doesn't come naturally for many of them. So because of how they're hired, you know, part of the culture of the whole organization. So they're really having to build this muscle, this leadership muscle of what does it look like to bring closed system and when do we need it? Because we're starting to watch ourselves spin. Hmm. Um, and then you know, very early in the conversation, you mentioned um, like the actions. And uh, can we talk a little bit what, what yeah. the, that, those are? Yes. So there are four actions which I think is pretty fascinating. Everything that we say can be coded into one of four actions. So the first one is move. So move sets direction. So you made a move just now. You said, hey, Marsha, let's talk about you know, the actions. Um, I followed by joining you. So follow is the second action and it gets behind or supports what's already been voiced in the conversation. The third is a pose and a pose offers correction. So it's, it's offering a different perspective. It says, you know, hey, hold on a minute. So I could have opposed you and said, well, um, I don't want to do that just yet. And then my new move might have been, well, let me talk about this first. So a pose is really, it's really clear and offers opposition. And then the fourth is called bystand. So bystand offers a morally neutral comment about what's happening in the conversation. So it, it bridges. Um, so I might bystand and say, uh, I might bystand about myself and say, you know, I'm noticing, I'm feeling really engaged in the conversation right now. So it's not setting direction. It's not following. It's just really naming what's happening. And uh, I guess the, yeah. the, the next thing I'd say about that is that um, move and oppose are the actions of advocacy and bystand and follow are the actions of inquiry. And we need all four of those actions to be voiced in order for the conversation to be effective. And yeah, happens, so yeah, often, what, sorry. <laughs> sorry. No, 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 that's exactly kind of where I was headed is, yeah. Um, how, yeah, how, what do you mean by they have to always be there? You know, why isn't yeah. it good enough to be like, hey, this is what we're going to go do now yeah. <laughs> or, or something? Yes, um, it would be lovely if it was. And I, and I spent a lot of years, um, I spent a lot of years believing that that was the case <laughs> until I met until I met this uh, theory. But um, yeah, so we need all four to be voiced and active in the conversation in order for the conversation to be effective. And the the easiest way I can tell you to find a, an example for yourself or for listeners would be to think about um, the last time you had the frustration of having the same conversation over and over and over again. 
Mm. Um, I think that that's the yellow flag. That's, so I often say, like my daughter and I have a, um, I call them Groundhog Day conversations, but my daughter and I, when she was younger, we had one, it was called Get Your Shoes On Please. And we had it every morning, you know, as we were getting ready to go somewhere. And it was me saying, get your shoes on and her saying, yes, okay. But then five minutes later, you know, she doesn't have her shoes on. And finally I was like, what, what are you, why aren't your shoes on? Uh, because I'm playing on the computer. Well, I need you to get them on now. And she'd say, okay, why aren't your shoes on? I'm getting them on. No, you're not. So one of the things that was happening in our conversation is that I'd say, you need to get your shoes on. She'd say, okay. But actually, um, she had no intention of getting her shoes on. Mm. So she was voicing a follow, but she was doing an oppose. And that is what happens day in and day out in corporate America. Mm. We have somehow managed out the voice of opposition. It's impolite. It's rude. It's not welcomed. Um, no thanks. <laughs> like I need it's gotten I even need worse in the done. past four years, probably because of the politics. You know, like politics yeah. says, uh, uh, yeah, you can't. You're not comfortable saying anything because all of a sudden we've got you know in society cancel culture. But that stems into well, what can I say and not say it in work as well? Yeah. <laughs> that might get me yeah. in trouble. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think we have, and it's a pattern of called, it's called courteous compliance. Mm -hmm. It's actually where the structure of move and follow are what get voiced in the room. And so it's the difference between what do I intend and then what do I voice? And a lot of times there's a, there's a gap between those two things. And so what that does is it takes the real conversation offline and sends it underground so it sends it to the chats or the one-on-ones or the, the phone calls that happen after the meeting. And I see, I see it happen over and over and over again. Like that's, it becomes a source. It's actually the thing that sits behind the front page crisis. Um, you know, both of those organizations actually had the structure of um, high and random power they uh, didn't have a lot of value for the language of affect. So affect was often managed. So any kind of any kind of thing that asked about how does how does that feel or what's that like for you was not welcomed. So that was the one that was the first thing that was missing. The second thing that was missing in both organizations for different reasons was actually the like a really clear oppose. It was viewed as um, time consuming or not being a team player. And I think that kind of narrative will come from the top team. And I think when that happens, like the real crisis is not having the right structures, the uh, communication structures online and voiced, because if they were, neither of those organizations would have ended up on the front page. But it is that when we get kind of caught up in this, well, it seems like it would just, like, I'm going to make a move. And uh, if no one disagrees, I'm going to assume that silence means consent and off we go. Mm. And can you do that for ordering, you know, t-shirts for the company picnic? Sure. Uh, can you do that over and over for six months, six years? It's going to catch up at some point. Like the, we can only sweep the real conversation under the rug, but for so long. And so then I think the, the boiling point looks like a front page crisis or it looks like um, leaders, you know, I think leadership teams can get themselves in hot water or find themselves, it's that moral dilemma um, of making decisions that have, they're feeling the outside pressure and without true, you know, oppose welcomed, like if you can't oppose the leader and that's scary. I get it. But I also think that that's the work of the senior leaders to do is to welcome it. So there's a bit about the fact that they've got to bring it, they've got to be okay with it. Mm. And I think that takes a lot of personal work to, to reach that space. What are some of the symptoms, I guess, or things that a company should look for mm. to start realizing that maybe they're operating and, you know, 
they're gravitating towards one, whether it's communication system, uh, operating yeah. system or communication style or, or yeah, any of those, how, how do they identify that? The, I'd say there, there are two things that I always start everybody off with, which is number one, how many times do you have the same conversation? Um, we had it even in my own company back at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, it was around a collaboration tool. And every 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 couple of weeks, we were back talking about the collaboration tool. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this, like at some point, I feel like I'm losing my mind because it can't, like we can't be, like is it really this big of a deal? Like why does this keep coming up? And it was through my own process of going, oh, wait a minute. Like we actually need to slow this down. So. We, we did our own intervention and it took us a couple of months actually to get to the bottom. It, it had nothing to do with the, communi- the collaboration tool. It was all about how we were working together and communicating. So I think the first thing to look for is how often and how many times do you find yourself having the same conversation? You, you, you're, you enter a room, the thing comes up again and you're going, I thought we decided this, why is it back? So I think that's the first flag. I think the second flag is, do you hear people push back? Particularly when you offer up, you, you as a positional leader, when you offer up an idea, do, do people push back? And then what's your reaction to it? Like, do you justify it or do you defend it? Or do you actually, I often say the, the, the seemingly um, crazy idea to do is to make it bigger. So someone says, Marsha, I think that's, I think that's ridiculous. Um, we would never, we would never do that or we should never do that. My first response, if I'm really honest, would likely be to defend, to go, well, wait a minute, you just don't understand. But I think our, the better answer is, oh, can you tell me more? Like, what do you see that I don't see? So it becomes a way of, of curiosity, but it also becomes a way of um, creating a part of our culture that says, it's okay to do that. Actually, I want you to do that because if you, what I know, what I know and what I believe now is if you don't do it here, you're going to do it offline. And then it becomes part of the subterranean. It, it just goes subterranean and it becomes toxic. It shows up like blame and assumptions and it just builds up. So I have, you know, I have this kind of mental model that says if it didn't get voiced here and in in the room, then it's going to get voiced somewhere else and it's not particularly helpful. So I think those are the two things. Like, do you hear people offering really clear oppose? Now, if they don't feel like it's okay for them to oppose, it'll come out as other action. So instead of a really clear pose that says, I disagree, what you'll hear it is, we'll make, we'll make a new move. So I, you say, I think we should, you know, do project A, and I introduce the subject about the picnic. Um, so you'll find yourself in meetings where topics change a lot, and it might feel like you're doing a lot of things or you're getting a lot of um, information covered, and you'll walk out of the meeting going, what did we what did we decide? (laughs) Like we talked about a lot, but what did we actually decide? So that'll be one pattern that shows up that means a pose might be missing. Um, The other one will be silence Um, or, or the, you know, the phrases that we all love of sure, you know, just, just tell me what you want me to do. Like it's the voice of follow, but it's, but you know, it's not. Mm. So sometimes if someone says that, I'll just go, ah, like, really? Like, what might, what might we be missing? Let's have that conversation first. Um, so I think you have to watch for it coming out in other ways. Uh, so if it's not welcomed, it'll, it'll seep out in different ways. Well, that's, uh, that's really interesting. Well, Marsha, we've, we've actually uh, came close to the end of time here. So um, <laughs> would love to hear what three things you want to leave top of mind with our audience are. Mm. I, I think the, um, I think the biggest piece that I would say is really what we were just talking about, like um, separating the what from the how. So pick a meeting that you're in uh, over the next week and just see if you can separate the topic. So the subject of what you're talking about, whether it's finances or strategy, and then also be looking at how people are engaging in the conversation. 
And those two things, I think there are two flags to be looking for, which is, am I hearing the same topic over and over again? Um, or, and am I hearing really, really clear pose? Like, is it okay? Is it welcomed? And if not, then even as a meeting participant, how could I, how could I welcome it by asking for differing opinions or what might be at risk or what might be wrong? So I think those two things would be the place that I would start. And I think the other piece of advice I'd have is um, catch yourself when you start to defend your point of view and think about how you can bring inquiry into the conversation. Well, excellent. Well, you, um, you, you have a book. I'd love to hear how folks can get a hold of your book or learn and learn more about what you do, get in contact with you. What do you? Yeah. Um, yeah. So the book is called Build Your Model for Leading Change. Um, the first couple of chapters actually outline the structure of structural dynamics um, that comes from David Cantor. So that book would have um, kind of an overview of what we've been talking about. It's also a guided workbook. Um, so the rest of it is really about reflection questions to help people kind of make sense of what their behavioral um, profile might be. So you can find that at buildyourmodel.com. You can also find it on Amazon or any of the, the other bookstores. And then uh, connecting with me, the best place to do that is on LinkedIn at Marsha Acker. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, thanks, Janet. And to our audience, until next time, keep your organizations healthy.